Good afternoon. I am Alexandria Ferguson of O&M Partners, and I want to welcome everyone to the Generation Mining Limited Town Hall webinar. Um, Generation Mining trades on the Toronto Exchange under the symbol GENM and under the symbol GENMF on the OTC. For those of you who are new to our broadcast, O&M is the link between the investing public and public companies. In past times, these groups passed each other like ships in the night. Our digital roadmap enables us to keep pace with tremendous changes in investor demographics and how they receive information. We want this broadcast to answer all of your questions. Questions can easily be sent in by going to the question panel of the GoToWebinar or by emailing any of us on the team. For any questions that remain unanswered, we'll follow up in a timely manner after the call. Just a reminder for those of you who have dialed in with your phone, the only way you can hear a pre recorded introductory presentation is on your computer speakers. Since that is not possible by phone, you'll be able to hear the main presentation after 10 minutes. So please stay tuned. Our introductory presentation comes today from Rob Keats. He's the editor and publisher of goldsilverpros.com. His subscriber digest emphasizes long term cycle investing in the precious metals market. He's also the author of the 2010 book, Drop Shadow, The Truth About the Economy. Rob's work has been featured on Yahoo Finance, MarketWatch, Nasdaq.com, Seeking Alpha, Talk Markets, Stockhouse, Mining Feeds, AppMex, GoldSeek, Financial Sense, Technically Speaking, and Silver Doctors, among others. His formal education consists of a master's degree in information security and a bachelor of science in business administration. He started in finance two decades ago, receiving college instruction in accounting, finance, marketing, and global business. So I'll turn it over to Rob. Hi, everyone. This is Robert Keynes. I'm the editor and founder of goldsilverpros.com. I've been given the honor of providing the intro to your main presentation today. Before we get into my presentation, I wanted to tell you a little bit about the site that I run at goldsilverpros.com. We offer a quarterly newsletter called The Golden Quarterly, as well as weekly interviews with experts and analysts in both the precious metals sector and in the economy. If you want to find out more about us, simply go to goldsilverpros.com and click on who we are. Many of my articles have been published in these outlets that you see on your screen over the last 10 years. The presentation I'm going to give you today is called Resources Are Essential for the U.S. Economy. I'm going to provide a special focus on platinum and palladium. The first chart is brought to us courtesy of the European Chemical Society on behalf of the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Foundation. The reason I included this chart is because it shows us the 90 natural elements that make up just about everything we use on a daily basis. And if you are one of the younger generation that relies on smartphones as your main communication method during the day, I wanted to point out this item on the bottom right hand corner, elements used in a smartphone that is labeled across this map. Meaning if we didn't have all of these elements available in our supply, we would not be able to use this smartphone technology. The other interesting thing about this chart is it provides us the amount of resources that we have. The orange colored resources show those that may have relative scarcity and may run out of in the next 100 years. The other uh, categories are limited availability in yellow and plenty of plentiful supply in green. According to the US Bureau of Economic Analysis, the total amount of resources used in the US economy in 2018, the year with the latest data available, was $893 billion. 44.9% of that went into oil and gas. 11.5% went into other mining outside of oil and gas. The non-metallic mineral products made up 14.9% and the primary metals such as aluminum, copper, lead, and zinc make up 28.7%. So what are minerals used for? I'm glad you asked. Let's look at a typical American's day and see what minerals we will use every day. We may wake up in the morning and decide to make a cup of coffee before we head out to work, in which we'll usually drive or take a bus, or maybe even sometimes the subway. Usually we'll work on a computer, whether we be working in the office or even if we're in retail and manufacturing, often we have computers in our jobs as well. Often we'll come home and make a nice dinner and then sometimes retire to the television to stream some Netflix or uh, play video games perhaps on the computer. So what minerals did we use in this process? Well, when we woke up, our alarm clock uses limestone, mica, talc, silica, and clay. And when we make coffee, we use aluminum and petroleum products. 
if we take a shower, then our shower uh, faucets are used of iron, aluminum, copper, silica, sand, limestone, talc, and feldspar. And if we're using shampoo and soap, we're often including coal tar, lithium clay, and selenium. When we ride to work in a car or a bus, we're using copper, iron, limestone, mica, talc, silica, various clays, petroleum products, lead, molybdenum, chromium, nickel, aluminum, and zinc. And if we have an electric car, then we're using 10 times of that first uh, metal listed in copper, as well as adding healthy amounts of lithium, cobalt, and other minerals as well. When we get to work and we start using a computer, we often use gold, silica, nickel, aluminum, zinc, iron, various petroleum products, and 30 other minerals too long to list on this slide. Let's say we come home and make dinner and we want to save time and use the microwave. Well, we're using silica, copper, gold, iron, and nickel. And if we decide to have a cup for water or our other favorite drink, we're using silica, limestone, and feldspar. And if we decide to sit down and watch TV or use the computer, we're using iron, silica, copper, aluminum, silver, and nickel. And we go to bed, our bed springs are made often of iron and nickel, and the rest of our beds are made of wood and textiles. The point being is that we could not have our current lifestyle without all of these different minerals that we pull out of the ground, and those minerals are pulled out of the ground through the mining process. I wanna pay special attention to a certain group of metals known as the platinum group metals or PGMs. What are the platinum group metals? Well, they include platinum, palladium, rhodium, iridium, osmium, and ruthenium. They commonly occur together in nature and are among the scarcest of the metallic elements, which is why they're called precious metals. Platinum and also palladium are used principally in catalysts for the control of automobile and industrial plant emissions. They're used in jewelry, they're using catalysts to produce acids, organic chemicals, and pharmaceuticals. And platinum and palladium are also used in bushings for making glass fibers used in fiber reinforced plastic and other advanced materials. They're used in electrical contacts, in capacitors, and in conductive and resistive films. The point being that without the platinum group metals, we would not have a lot of the technologies that we take for granted today. The main use of the platinum group metals is in automotive catalytic converters. They're considered to be a green technology because platinum and palladium help reduce polluting auto emissions by removing, among other things, nitrogen oxide, carbon monoxide, and hydrocarbon emissions. As we see here in the picture, we have a catalytic converter, and it shows that the gases flow through a dense honeycomb structure, often made from ceramic, and coated with the PGM catalysts. In addition, a lot of times we also add in a third PGM element that's called rhodium. The honeycomb structure here means the gases touch a bigger area of the catalyst at once, and so they're converted more quickly and efficiently to non-toxic water vapor and other vapors. Well, then the question becomes how much PGM is used in an automobile? Well, thanks to the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine, we have this chart showing the amount of metals used in a typical automobile. Leading the pack are iron and steel at over a ton of 2,124 pounds, followed up by aluminum at 240 pounds, carbon at 50 pounds, copper at 42, silicon at 41, lead at 24, and zinc at 22. On down to the bottom where we get to either platinum or palladium, where we use as little as one-tenth of a troy ounce or about three grams. The good news is because these metals are very rare, we don't have to use very much of them in the catalytic process in automobiles. But we will also see how we don't have a great supply of those and further how getting to those supplies can often be difficult. I wanted to speak a little bit about uh, platinum and palladium as used in jewelry. About 29% of palladium produced every year is used in jewelry applications. And I'm going to compare palladium and platinum. Palladium is less dense than platinum, so it's less heavy to wear. And for those people who don't like wearing heavy jewelry, they may choose palladium over platinum. Palladium is also harder than platinum, so it's harder to scratch. However, both platinum and palladium are both hard to scratch metals, so both are uh, used equally in uh, jewelry. Both platinum and palladium are 95% pure compared with white gold. White gold consists of 42% other white metals, usually nickel, where only 58% of that piece of jewelry is in actual gold and it's the nickel that gives the white gold its silvery luster. Getting back to the amount of platinum group metals available, we can see here on this chart from the Johnson Matthey 2019 PGM market report 
that the vast majority of our PGM group metals comes from two countries in South Africa and Russia, whereas only about 16% comes from other places in the world. The unfortunate aspect of this is that both countries have higher geopolitical risk for the Western world. South Africa, which has long been an ally of uh, the Western world in North America, is going through different geopolitical uh, problems, which has led to some uh, shortening of supply and some mine closures, which has led to less platinum group metals being available. In addition, Russia is not the most friendly nation towards the United States and other Western nations, so Western nations are looking for alternative sources of platinum group metals. There have not been a lot of findings of economic platinum group metals in the West, except in recently in Canada. I want to take a moment to invite you to a very special conference that Gold Silver Pros is putting on. It's called the North America Monetary Metal Summit. It'll be coming to you virtually online August 6th and 7th of 2020. You can register for free at goldsilverpros.com forward slash NAMS 2020. That's goldsilverpros.com forward slash NAMMS 2020. We're very excited to host the legendary author of the Morgan Report, David Morgan, as well as many other guest speakers, including Nick Bereshiff of BNG Group, Rob Kirby of Kirby Analytics, Alex Newman of The New American, Chris Marcus of Arcadia Economics, Kenneth Amaduri of Crusher Street, as well as many, many more presenters. We would love to see you online. You will have the ability to talk with the exhibitors and the presenters at the conference. Thank you very much for listening to me during this presentation. I hope I've provided hope you I've provided helpful, you information helpful information that you can use for your you future can. presentation. If you have any questions on uh, information regarding the economy or precious metals, feel free to reach out to us at goldsilverpros.com and you can email me directly at robert at goldsilverpros.com. Stay tuned for your feature presentation. Thank you so much for that, Rob. That was wonderful. We're going to turn now to our main event. Um, presenting is Kerry Knoll. He's the executive chairman and director of Generation Mining and a visionary company builder. He's co-founded several successful mining companies over his 25-year career, including Wheaton River, bought by Gold Corp, and Thompson Creek, acquired by Centera Gold. Kerry's track record proves that those who are successful in the mining industry building one company tend to do it again and again. Although Kerry was a gold buff for the first 15 years of his career, his greatest success came when he started focusing on the less sexy overlooked metals such as molybdenum, lithium, and zinc. But he found the most overlooked metal in palladium. Few in the investment community seemed to notice that palladium had already soared from 800 an ounce in 2018 to 1200 in 2019. His instincts for value led him to the Marathon Project in Ontario, which is the largest undeveloped Palladium project in North America. It's a pleasure to have Kerry with us, and I'm going to turn the call over to him now. Thank you. Okay. So uh, Generation Mining has uh, only been in business a couple of years now. We, uh, we started in 2018 as a, a spin-out from a company called Pine Point Mines, which uh, was bought by Osisco Metals, one of the big uh, mining and precious metal uh, groups in, here in Canada. We, um, our big acquisition, though, only happened last July uh, in, in 2019. We acquired a 51% interest in the largest undeveloped Palladium project in North America, and we've got an option to increase that interest to uh, to 80%. The um, the project has about 8.6 million ounces, so it's uh, it's it's in the top tier of of sizes of precious metal deposits in the world. And uh, we've also got another smaller inferred uh, uh, resource of a little over 900,000 ounces. So we're we're pushing 10 million ounces, and it's going to probably continue to grow as we explore. Um, the property, and it's really important in mining uh, when you're investing in mining, is is where where is it located? And we're right on the Trans Canada Highway. We're near Power Rail. Uh, we're in the province of Ontario, which has got a conservative government, uh, and uh, the, the the government is very very pro mining and wants to uh, open up the north further. Now uh, we completed a PEA uh, in January of this year, and the numbers were reported online. We had a big run up in our share price. Uh, based on that news, because the numbers were actually quite stunning, and I'll, I'll get into those in, in a few minutes. 
And uh, just money-wise, uh, people want to know if we need to raise money. We're we're sitting on about $14 million in cash, which is enough to get us through uh, our, our next steps, which I'll, I'll go through later on in the presentation. So this is the breakdown of metal in the ground that we currently have. And the, the lighter colored boxes are the measured and indicated. For those of you who aren't uh, that familiar with mining, measured and indicated are the top two categories of resources. And uh, you got a pretty high level of confidence that they're actually there. The, the, the bottom tier is called something called inferred and, and uh, inferred isn't quite as sure, but we've got most of our ounces here in the uh, measured and indicated categories. I'll just talk a little bit about our people. We have been assembling and continuing to assemble uh, uh, the team of people. We need to both uh, develop this project and to uh, to expand this project. So um, Jamie uh, Levy, who's the CEO, and myself have been working together for about eight years. Um, myself, my, my background is um, so founding several mining companies. Um, the first four mining companies I founded all went into production, which is really unusual in the junior mining space. Um, and the other two since that time were both acquired before we got into production. So, and both of those projects are, are being developed by the subsequent uh, buyers. Uh, and I just want to point out Drew Anwell, who's our latest uh, addition to the team. He joined us in in March, and Drew is was the uh, the mine manager uh, when they built the mine at uh, Detour Gold. And Detour Gold was was one of the biggest uh, open pit gold mines in North America, uh, and uh, was was acquired. Uh, last year but for for about just under five billion canadian dollars so drew has uh has done this before he's done it with barrack he's done it with plaster dome before that so he's um he, he's gonna he's gonna run the show here when we uh, get moving on to building our mine and i just want to point out a couple of the independent directors here we've got a, a really good crew of directors uh, some of them are management but four of them are are independent Cashel Meager is the senior vice president and COO of, um, of HUD Bay, which is a big base metal mining company. Phil Walford is a, uh, was until he retired recently, uh, he was the president and CEO of Marathon Gold, which is developing a very nice looking uh, gold project in, in the Canadian Maritimes. And uh, over here on the left, uh, on the bottom, uh, Paul Murphy joined us last fall. He's the chairman of Alamos Gold, a big gold mining company. He was the CFO of Guyana Goldfields when they built their mine, so he's got that that mine construction experience, which is really really important because because most people don't have it in our business. And before that, he was actually head of the mining group for Price Waterhouse Coopers as an accountant. So he's a a very very senior guy. He had some of his clients for some of the biggest uh, gold mining companies in the world. So here's a look at where we are location-wise. And, and, and as you can see, we're uh, just on the North Shore of Lake Superior here. We're just down the highway from the big Hemlo uh, gold mine, which has produced about 25 or 26 million ounces over the years. Um, Alamos uh, Island gold mine over here. Hart gold mine just went into production last year. Hard Rock uh, gold mine, it's a Santerra premier project that is in uh, I just got permitted and uh, is, is, is probably going to be constructed in the next couple of years. Uh, the Lactazil mine, uh, which uh, was owned by North American Palladium, got bought for a billion dollars by, by uh, Impala, a South African company, last year. So really in a very, very active, one of the, one of the most active mining areas really in the world for new mine construction and, and M&A activity and, and different things that are, are, are going on. Here's a little bit of a close-up of our property. We have three deposits. So here's the Marathon deposit, which all of our economic numbers are based on this deposit. We didn't include the other two, the Geordie and the Sally deposits. Both of those are, are sizable. They have about a million and a half ounces of palladium equivalent between them, but it's um, but the real prize is here, here at the Marathon deposit. And uh, I just want to point out some of the infrastructure we've got. We've got an airport literally surrounded by our property. There's a new power line being constructed, a 230 kilovolt power line that's going to go right through our property, through the bottom of our property there. And that's really going to make our power uh, a lot cheaper than it would be. Some of those other mines I showed you all have to generate their own power. And of course, it's very expensive and it's not very green. This is uh, all power that's generated from nu nuclear uh, power plants in Southern Ontario. Uh, the CPR main rail line goes right by our property. That's the Trans-Canada Highway. And here we got the town of Marathon. And the town of Marathon has is a, is a been a mining town for many years. 
Uh, it was a pulp and paper town before that, but it, it's really a town that is um, uh, shrinking because the Hemlo mines are, are starting to get a little long in the tooth. And we're looking at uh, perhaps, um, um, you know, reinvigorating that town by, uh, by, by building our mine. Just going to get into a bit of the history of the project. It was developed by a lot of different companies for about 25 years. And the reason it was never built as a mine before that was the palladium price was always low. It was $200, $300 an ounce. Sometimes it would bounce up to $500 an ounce, but it was just really too low. Uh, they were really looking at the copper credit. And as, as I think you saw in the, in the earlier slide, we've got over a billion uh, pounds of, of copper on this project. So, but really now palladium is trading at $1,800, $1,900 an ounce. It's a, it's a different situation. and. Uh, um, now this is a project that's time has really come. Um, back when when uh, Palladium did take a bit of a bounce in 2010 in the aftermath of the financial crisis, um, Stillwater actually bought this project. Stillwater was an, an American Palladium mining company. Uh, bought this project for 118 million dollars, uh, and that's against our market cap today of of about uh, 50 million uh, Canadian dollars, which is about 38 uh, million U.S. dollars. So. Um, they actually managed to sell 25% of it to Mitsubishi for $81 million in 2012. And then they shelved it in 2014 when palladium prices backed down and uh, the capex looked like to be a little higher than they thought. We bought this from uh, Sabani in late uh, July last year. And uh, um, as I mentioned earlier, we can bring our ownership to 80% by spending 10 million Canadian dollars within four years of that date. But we're going to probably have that done uh, by, if not the, the fourth quarter this year, uh, the first quarter of, of next year, and we're financed to do that. So we're going to own 80% of this. Sabani does have a back-in right. They can uh, buy back 31% by paying 31% into the joint venture, so uh, of the capex, and that would be about $133 million based on our PEA. So it would be very expensive. We think it's much more likely that they would either buy us or uh or or back off uh, we, you know it, it doesn't make financial sense to me for them to back in but we'll they do have that right so i mentioned earlier we have a, a pea that was done in uh in january of this year uh it, it estimates a four, 14 year mine life producing just under 200 uh, 000 ounces palladium equivalent a year and interestingly it's got a capex of 431 million canadian dollars which is about 320 million us the internal rate of return of this, and this is done at 1275 palladium, bear in mind palladium's at, at almost $1,900 right now. Um, at, at 1275 palladium, it had an internal rate of return of 30% and a, a net present value of $871 million. And that's a really important number to look at in terms of its relationship with CapEx. You almost never see in the mining business a CapEx that is half the amount of the uh, net present value, and and that really shows how robust this project is. And that was using two-year trailing metal prices. If you use spot prices, really the spot prices of today, um, which was about the same as it was in December when we, we uh, when we put the pin in in the numbers for our report, um, it would have an internal rate of return of 45.8 percent. That's that's a fabulous use of capital, and an, an after-tax net present value of 1.54 billion which again, uh, that's about three and a half times our capex. Again, numbers you rarely ever see. We could produce palladium for just over $500 an ounce with an all-in sustaining cost of $586 an ounce, which is about a third of uh, what, what it's trading at today. And here are some numbers uh, just for your reference. And this, this, this PowerPoint is on our website, so you can go back and see it. And it just breaks down uh, our, our tons per day, the amount of material we're going to produce over the years, um, you know, what it's going to cost. Um, and here's a number that's really important down here, the payback period. So at the study number, which was 1275 palladium, we will pay back all of that capital in two and a half years. The only other uh, economic, uh, or, or sorry, the only other palladium projects in the world that have economic uh, uh, parameters attached to them, and there's only two or three others at, at the development stage, they have uh, payback periods ranging from six to, to nine years. So it's, uh, um, it's a really short payback period. At today's palladium price, the payback period is a year and a half, which is you know bankers love that because there's just the, it just cuts out so much of the risk. There, there's so much risk 
in a long payback period because you could have geopolitical, you could have uh, commodity prices changing, all sorts of things. But in a year and a half payback, it's uh, it just cuts all that risk out. And this is a breakdown of capital. I won't get too much into it. Uh, again, it's all it's there for reference. Um, one of the important things to me on a project is is you know what's it going to look like if palladium goes down? We don't think it's going to go down. But what if it does? What if I'm wrong? Well, at $900 palladium, which is half of what it's trading at today, this project still has an IRR of almost 20%, which is still a really, really good return. It also has a payback period of four years, which isn't as good as, of course, the year and a half, but four years is, is quite reasonable in our in our business. So I, I, th I think in, in, a, in, in, in any possible scenario going forward, we're going to see uh, uh, th this mine going ahead. Um, uh, just another one, uh, the sensitivities to CapEx and OpEx. If, if, if OpEx or CapEx, if we're wrong in our PEA and the numbers are 20% higher, again, we have a uh, internal rate of return north of 20% in either one of them, even if we're wrong on the uh, OpEx and CapEx. So this is what it looks like, uh, it will look like from a drone view. Um, you've got uh, three pits here, which we're probably going to combine into one pit in our feasibility study. You've got the waste truck right next door, so you don't have to haul it very far. You've got the tailings downhill, and it's, uh, again, not very far, a couple of kilometers away. So uh, a very, very compact uh, mine site, considering the, the size of the mine. I won't get into the details of the metallurgy, but the metallurgy has been done to death. There's been five studies. We're doing additional studies. The only reason we're doing any studies right now is because we we think that there's technology that has been uh, developed and put into the market in the last 10 years that wasn't used in our study. And uh, our study, uh, the initial study was done in, in 2012. So we're um, we're looking at this, uh, the, the at the bottom here, the stage flotation reactors. We think that can lower our CapEx somewhat, and we think it can also uh, improve recoveries. We also got some other opportunities. Um, only 37% of our resource was used in our PEA. So we got another 90 million tons in the uh, in the main deposit. We've got the Geordie deposit, the Sally deposit, which I mentioned. We've also got the possibility of locking in some higher uh, palladium prices than our PEA um, when we begin construction. And that's, that's our goal. We're talking to traders, traders who are the go-betweens between the mining companies and the, the manufacturers of catalytic converters. Uh, the guys who make the catalytic converters, of course, are very concerned about the price of palladium, but they're also concerned about supply. And I'll get into supply and demand in a moment. So here's the palladium market slide. We've got a couple here. Um, palladium has been probably the best performing metal uh, of any size in the world. It's gone up 400% since 2016. Most of it is used in auto catalysts. The, uh, in the introduction, uh, he mentioned that about 30% of it was used in jewelry, but I think that's a bit out of date. More recently, 87%, um, I believe, uh, was used in auto catalysts. Uh, it depends on which uh, which report you read, of course. But uh, and a typical automobile today uses between three and seven grams of palladium. Um, that number was lower, but what's happened over time is the requirements are to have cleaner and cleaner air. And that's always been led by California, but more recently, um, China and um, uh, India and now uh, Europe have all started to, to introduce North American standards for their air. And all of those has, have required higher loadings of palladium per car. And those big SUVs now, they, they can have uh, up to seven grams of palladium. Hybrids, interestingly, can have up to seven grams of palladium. The little the little cars the they can still have about three grams of palladium so it just depends on on the car and the engine size and sometimes on the te technology and and sometimes they mix in a little platinum and a little rhodium and they, there's different ways of doing it but different different formulas but at the end of the day the emissions have to be a certain level and if they're not you can't sell a car it's it's one of the only metals that's essentially mandated in in for every vehicle that is sold everywhere in the world. So, um, and, and you've got a limited supply of it. There's only, the, the demand is 11 million ounces, but the mines only supply uh, a little under 7 million ounces. And you've got another three, a little over 3 million ounces from uh, recycling. The recycling has gone up double digits every year for the last five or six years because of the price been rising. But of course the recycling now is starting to flatline because they've really raided every junkyard in the world for every bit of palladium they can find. 
and uh, now it's just uh, recycling is just based on what they can uh, taking cars uh, out of uh, out of service. And different uh, again, different people have different uh, uh, estimates on the deficits, but the, everybody agrees that there's a deficit, and that's why the price is is, is up where it is. This is a 10-year, or sorry, a 20-year chart, and in the first 10 years from from about 2001, the market was in surplus because it was being mined as a as a as a, it was a byproduct of nickel mines and platinum mines, and platinum prices were a lot higher, and so they were having to mine the the, the palladium, but it wasn't all being used. But over time, as the plat palladium loadings went up and up and up in cars and car sales uh, worldwide went up and up and up with it, what was happening in China. You got into a deficit in about 2012, and that deficit has continued, and it's going to continue for the foreseeable future because we're just not making an, enough palladium. That deficit has been made up by people's investments and in stockpiles and ETFs. The ETFs have been rated for, for the plat palladium metal. Uh, the Russian government had five million ounces in stockpile. Uh, that's that's largely sold from from what we've heard. Uh, so our, uh, we think that deficit's going to going to continue. And again, the, the 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 pandemic has has affected both mining and car production, and it seems to have been a bit of a wash because the price has been hanging around eighteen nineteen hundred dollars. So we're trying to compare ourselves with the other palladium developers here in Canada, and they're just uh, and some of these are, are around the world, but we're by far the largest of the developers, other than one company that's out of uh, out of South Africa, called Platinum Group Metals, which has a lovely, very large deposit, but it's it's deep and it's expensive to to build. Um, but other than them and um, us, I mean, we're we're trading at five dollars per ounce of uh, palladium equivalent in the ground. Um, if you compare us with other precious metal companies, gold specifically, um, the average uh, company that's near infrastructure and and trades at about seventy-one dollars per ounce in the ground for at, at the development stage, and we're trading again at five, whether you say it's gold or palladium, because they're near the near the same price. I'm going to talk just a moment about exploration. This rock is a, a thing of beauty to uh, to to one of us miners. It's a uh, a rock that was found on our property in 2016, and what's interesting is, is, is we're pretty sure it was not formed in, in the known deposits, in those three known deposits that we have, even though it was found near one of them, because it's a different mineralization. This is something called massive sulfides, and it's, um, it's very rich. Our average ore grade in our PEA, in our study, was 1.24 grams of, P, of, of plat, palladium equivalent per ton. Well, this has 188 grams per ton of platinum group metals and another 9% copper and a decent amount of nickel as well. This is this is one of the highest grade samples ever found. The, the question is, is where did it come from? And we don't know where it came from, but a bunch of academics have studied it because it's such an interesting sample and, and you just don't find these very often. And this one group of uh, of geologists wrote this paper and had it published in a, in a peer review journal showing that um, this is really, really extreme palladium enrichment and where did it come from? And a couple of hundred pages later, later in that study, they came up with uh, a conclusion that this is a very uh, PGE enriched environment that is similar to that of Norilsk. Norilsk is the largest palladium source in the world in Russia. It produces a, a, about a third of the, of the world's palladium, as well as a lot of nickel. And they also came to the conclusion that this rock was brought to the surface by from a deep reservoir by a subsequent volcanic action. So you would have had a volcano um, um, erupt and, and, and cause the formation of an initial deposit and then harden and then maybe several million years later, the thing erupts again. And this time it breaks off parts of the of the original deposit and brings them to surface where it's it's forming another deposit. Here's a rather technical slide, but we're just going to show you uh, what we're looking for. So we're looking for the source of that high grade. So here's our our marathon deposit. This is where most of our palladium is up here, and this is the surface here. If you go down the volcanic conduit, so this is where the lava came came up. That's where we're looking. And that's what this is where what the deposit looks like on surface. That's the same deposit as this. So we're looking down here, and I'll go on to the next slide. 
So again, this one is represents the main deposit. What we're thinking is that there's a, a chance that down here there was a, a sulfide pool. So you get a like a trap in a in underneath a, your kitchen sink to, to 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 trap all the heavy particles. Well, the same thing happens in volcanic action. And if you got if you got a, a little trap here, the heavy the heavy particles all fall in there. And some of them actually come up in, in the thing and then and then as as it starts to harden the heavy particles fall back down and it enriches it even further. So we're thinking that this rock could have been formed in a deposit down below. And that's what we're looking for. And and if that's the case, this could be one of the richest, uh, richest uh, PGM deposits ever found. Uh, a really good example. And one of the things we're doing in order to find that is it was we're doing a survey of something called magnetotellurics. Because there's a project not far from ours that use magnetotellurix, and again, this is the same sort of horizon. This is a volcanic uh, uh, conduit, and then where you get it leveling out, that's where you can get the accumulations. And they did an MT survey, and lo and behold, they found a spot where it levels out, so they drilled it, and they've got some of the best uh, uh, drill, uh, and you can't really see them on this slide. I, I'm going to clean that up, but it's a uh, it's a very, very nice uh, drill intercept, very high grade. It's eight meters of, I think, five grams of, uh, of PGEs, which is a lovely, lovely grade for, for mining underground. Bear in mind that that rock we had was 188 grams. This one was five, but uh, <clears throat> it just, just starts to indicate it. Another thing we found, and I'll go down to the bottom right here, is, is we did a, a seismic survey on this project last year, and the seismic survey found a big body of something, some kind of dense rock that's down uh, about a kilometer, about a thousand meters down, which is not that deep in terms of mining. And we don't know what that is, but that could be heavy metal. That could be a massive sulfide deposit. It could be other things as well. So we've mo we've modeled that into a uh, into a possibility now there's a, a a mine just across lake superior from us called the eagle mine lundine mining is mining it's very rich in nickel and copper uh, but it's very very similar geology to what we found in our seismic survey last year so again and, and this this down here represents the same as this here and we we really think think that again this is remember the conduit leveling out so that's where it, where it would level out and uh, um, that's where you would get the accumulation and that's what we're hoping that, that this is so we're going to be drilling those this summer um, we're doing some more geophysics we're doing that MT survey but we are going to be uh, drilling those targets this summer and with a little bit of luck we'll we'll hit something we don't need it to have a very good mine here we've got a very good mine uh, IRR of, of, of 30 percent at uh, much lower palladium prices, IRR at 45% today. I mean, it's a good mine. But if we find this rich deposit, it's, it's going to be a game changer for us. So we've got a lot of different uh, uh, things happening. Um, one of the things I'm proud of at this company that we've done is, is we've, we've, what we've accomplished in less than a year. We acquired this, we financed it, we updated the resource, we did a PEA study, and we released that on January 6th this year. We're working on a new listing. We're trading uh, on the Canadian Securities Exchange. Uh, we're, we're trying to upgrade that. We also just got recently listed on the uh, OTC uh, QB, I guess. And uh, so we're, it's a little easier to trade us uh, down in the United States as well. Our next steps, our next big steps are a feasibility study and our permitting. Permitting, we're thinking, is going to take about two years. So starting uh, middle of this year and, and hopefully uh, being all done and, and wound up early in 2022. At that time, we hope to begin construction. Construction is about 18 months, and then by 2023, uh, we will be in production. That's our timeline. It's aggressive, but we're aggressive people, and I've usually made my timelines over the years in the different companies I've had that, uh, that have built mines. So just to wrap it up, um, a capital structure of the company, 130 million shares out. Our market cap at 40 cents. I think we're 38 or 39 right now is 52 million Canadian dollars. We've got a pretty good shareholders list. Sabani, uh, who we bought the project from, owns eight and a half percent of us. You know, Sabani is uh, is the largest platinum and the second largest palladium producer in the world. Uh, Lucas Lundin, he's a mining legend, a billionaire. Um, he's got oil companies, he's got mining companies, uh, base metal, he's got gold mining companies. 
and uh, he's he's uh, participated in in most of our financings, and uh, he he like he really likes this project. Osisco Mining again um, has written checks for us. Osisco is a very successful gold explorer in Canada, and they're they're very cashed up, and they they invest in other companies from time to time, and they've uh, invested in in this one as well. And of course, Eric Sprott, those of you that know Eric, is a uh, is a, another mining billionaire. He's uh, he invests in a lot of different companies, but he he invested. Uh, he bought all of his shares in our last financing at 52 cents. So it's uh, at the, the, that's quite a bit higher than uh, than our shares are at now. That was just pre the pandemic. And a management and directors own almost seven percent of the company. We're probably over it by now because we've all been buying shares the last little while. So. Uh, uh, and again, all of our shares we bought either out of the market or at the same financing prices as everyone else. We didn't hand out a bunch of founder stock when we, we, we started this company. So that, that sums up the uh, main part of the uh, presentation. Uh, now we're going to open it up uh, for questions. Great presentation, Carrie. Um, we'll start today with Marshall Barrel. Marshall, can you unmute yourself? Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, excellent presentation. Uh, a, a couple of questions. One, uh, your arrangements with Simone, you say they've got the option to uh, uh, get back to 51%. Is, is there a formula or set price if they decide to do that, or uh, if they decide to they want the, the whole project back and buy you out there's no formula for them buying us out there is a formula for them to if they want to buy back the 31 percent and that formula is is quite simple we're going to take the capital costs as they are in the feasibility study and they have to write a check to the joint venture for 31 percent of that so let's say in the pea that number was 431 million dollars so they would have to write a check for 133 million dollars just to get back to 51%. And then we would participate going forward. So that would mean, the, the, the bottom line numbers means we would own 49% of this mine for putting up 33% of the money. Uh -huh, that, because you form a, a joint venture and move forward pro rata on the uh, expense and the, the revenue and the profit, I take yes, it. Yes, that's right. We think it's much more likely that they would take us out bias because to pay 133 million for 31 percent you know it would make a hell of a lot more sense to pay you know whatever our market cap is plus a premium uh, for a hundred percent because they're, they're going to you know the 80 percent like it just it it it's well, something would... that they did their only reason that they wanted that back in they told us at the time bear in mind sabani has never built a mine in their in their company's existence. They've expanded mines, they, they, but they've never built one from scratch and they've never done anything in Canada. So for them to come in, they're producing 4 million ounces of precious metals a year. For them to come in to Canada and spend that kind of money to have an extra, well, at 51%, they would have less than 100,000 ounces a year. Uh, of production, it, it wouldn't really make much much sense for the, for them to do that. The reason they told us that they wanted that back in interest is going back to our exploration program, and their concern is that if we if we discover that big, very rich ore body that they think could lurk down there somewhere, then they want a chance to to develop that. I don't think they're that interested in developing. You know, they're 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 an eight billion dollar company. This this is you know we're a we're a a fifty million dollar company. It's just they they they're they're just much much bigger than us. I hope that helps. But if you find that big pot of palladium, then they could get very interested in having the project, and and in that event, likely to have the whole company or the whole project, and not just share it. Yeah, I would, I, I would think that they would be be a, a very um, strong candidate to take us out. Yes. Because also the South African mining companies are looking to diversify out of South Africa. South Africa has a problem with uh, electricity. They don't generate enough for the mines to, to operate at comfortable levels. Yeah, and they and Sivane certainly has gotten far more active in North America. Uh, going on to something else, 
with COVID and what's what's happening or happened with it, do you see that as, as a plus or a minus for uh, your development and bringing on new production? I don't think it's going to affect us too much, um, assuming that they come up with a vaccine within the next two years. And the reason for that is, is most of what we're doing is desk work. We're doing the feasibility study. We're doing engineering work. We're doing metallurgical testing in a lab, um, but the lab is using all its distancing. We're doing some exploration, but again, the exploration company, the, the Canadian uh, uh, PDAC organization has put out protocols for exploration to, to be safe during COVID. Um, and, and we're not doing anything, there's nothing we're doing where it, it's intensive, where people have to work side by side. And even as we develop the mine, this is an open pit mine. This isn't where underground where people work, work elbow to elbow. This is, this is an open pit mine where people, you know, one guy will drive a 300 ton truck. So it, it's just, a, it, it's not really a, a, a one of those ones. The types of mines, th these types of mines in the world, they didn't close during COVID. They, they, they continue to, to mine. Okay, fine. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Marshall. Um, we'll turn now to Chesley Morton. Chesley, do you have any questions today? Uh, I don't, but I want to say it was a great uh, presentation. I look forward to hearing more on this one. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for that, Chesley. Um, we'll turn to David Kellerman then. David. David, you are unmuted if you have any questions. Sounds like we might have lost him. Yeah, we might have lost him. We'll turn to Doug and circle back to David Kellerman later. Doug Loud, do you have any questions for Carrie today? Uh, this is really very interesting. You used the wonderful term cashed up. Um, I find your uh, what I'll refer to as the big, I'm a lawyer, so I'm easily confused. I find your big rock part very, very interesting. Have you got enough money to keep doing what you want to do with the regular project while do the drilling to find out if that big blob is down there? Yeah, so uh, I, I didn't talk about our budget, but uh, the budget for, for the next, uh, till, till the end of 2021, at the end of 2021, we expect to have our feasibility study done, a production decision made, and our permits either in hand or very close to in hand. So what is all that gonna cost? Well, in rough numbers, feasibility study is gonna be three and a half million dollars. Feasibility, or the permitting is gonna be $3 million. The exploration we're talking about is gonna be $2 million. So that brings us up to eight and a half million dollars. And the burn rate in the company is about gonna be about another million and a half dollars. So we that our budget is is around ten million dollars. There's other things, um, so it's 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 uh, you know, but we have the money to do all of the things we're planning to do right now. That's so great. that's what I say cashed up. That that that's great. Um, permitting, I take it where you are is not the end of the world. This is a mining project, not a permitting project. Well, we are in Canada and we do have to deal with two governments, the federal government and the provincial government. Um, the federal government uh, is is a little harder on, on mining companies than the, the, the provincial government currently because they're, they're a liberal government and the federal, the provincial government's conservative. Um, but that said, there has been uh, about 10 mines permitted in our province in the last four years. So, and none of them, none have been turned down. So that's that's a really important stat, and uh, the 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 point is is you have to do it right. You have to hire the right geol uh, uh, biologists. You have to hire the right people to do the right studies and present them in a way that the government people can understand. And um, the previous owner, Stillwater, of this project did a lot of work. Those studies are good studies that they did. We're updating them all right now, and we'll be resubmitting them to the government around the end of this year, and um, and then going through the the various levels of bureaucracy that you have to do to get something permitted. But nobody we've talked to in government has said anything to us, and we've had meetings with over 50 people. Uh, no one has said to us at all that this looks like it's gonna be a hard project to permit. So that's good. It, that's it doesn't leach acid. The, the biggest problem in mining is when tailings or waste rock or, or mine workings leach acid into the environment. We don't have acid in our rocks. So or the little bit that we have, we'll be able to mitigate by uh, 
by putting it uh, underneath at the bottom of the tailings pond. Great, thank you very much, very interesting. Thanks for the questions, Doug. We'll turn now to Heinz Toma. Heinz, you have questions for Carrie today. Yeah, Carrie, excellent presentation. Uh, a, a, uh, something which I am a bit surprised about is that your stock is trading at this level. Uh, incidentally, I saw that you issued uh, some options in April at 52 cents. To whom was that? That was to um, uh, Drew Anwell, our new uh, chief operating officer. And he's the key guy that's going to build the mine for us. So I find it remarkable that you issue uh, options at 52 cents while the stock at the time, I think, was trading at 36 cents. So, well, I mean, you know, a lot of other companies seem to, to put the stock under pressure and then they issue options. You you uh, did it at a much higher price, so I mean it's great. Well, the, one of the reasons for that is because we did a financing in January of, of, of ten million dollars at fifty two cents, and we didn't think it was fair to those investors to uh, turn around and then issue because of COVID and take advantage of COVID and, and issue options at a lower price. So we we just thought fair is fair, and I think our our shareholders appreciate that. No, that's super. Excellent, thank you. Thanks, Heinz. Um, I'd like to turn now to Murray Vandeveld. Murray, <clears throat> questions today? Yeah, Carrie, first of all, interesting project, and I knew that from the previous presentation, but I just wanted to compliment you on touching a lot of bases in your presentation. Often people leave out a lot of uh, facts which you covered, so it made it easier. But the other thing I wanted to talk about, um, 23, so we see a lot of estimates that uh, by 24, 25, maybe 10, 20 percent of the uh, auto production in the world will be electric vehicles. And I'm just, you, you must have thought about this. Uh, right now, the supply and demand looks terrific. I'm just wondering by the time you get to market, if in fact, we're producing 15% fewer automobiles using catalytic converters. What do you think that might do to the price of palladium? Well, first of all, um, a couple of points. Um, if that is happening, copper is going to be trading at 4 or $5, and we've got a billion pounds of copper, number one. Number two, on the palladium side, Yes, some of the people are predicting 15% by 2025. Some people are saying that 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 10% by 2030. There's different numbers out there. But a key number to remember is that if the, the same studies that are saying there's going to be somewhere between 10 and 15% electric cars by certain dates are saying that the hybrid car will be 40 to 50% of the market by those same dates. Hybrids require more palladium than a gasoline, regular gasoline powered car. And the reason for that is because your catalytic converter doesn't start converting until it's it colder. gets hot. Yeah. yeah, colder. And hybrids run colder because they're on and off, on and off. So they need more palladium. So the palladium demand is actually thought if, if, if the conversions to hybrid and, and electric go the way people think they're going to go, then, then they think that that palladium is uh, is actually the consumption is actually going to go up. Number one, and then the second item in there is that if it goes even higher, electrics, which I don't think it can do. Um, I don't think we have the energy grid right now in the world to go up to 30% of, of uh, automobiles. But if it did, um, we've got copper, and copper is going to go through the roof. And bear in mind, back in the day, this was considered a copper project with a palladium credit. So, and the last thing, um, I remember when uh, platinum was twice the price of palladium. <laughs> I don't remember whether that was 10, 20, or 30 years ago. Yeah. But, um, and, and obviously you're predominantly palladium, but I'm doing a lot of work and aware of the fact that uh, in the developing world, and particularly Western Europe, a lot of emphasis now on fuel cells, particularly for heavy transportation. So um, where you had some platinum for diesel trucks, but you know, 
Have you got any idea of the amount of, if the fuel cell hydrogen revolution takes hold, what that might do for platinum? Might we not get platinum back up to where gold and palladium well, are today? Platinum would go through the roof. A typical fuel cell uses one to two ounces of platinum, not grams, ounces. Okay. Therefore, there's not enough, there's not enough platinum in the world. I mean, there is enough platinum in the world probably because one of the reasons that platinum was higher all those times is because platinum was, was an investment like gold. People were buying platinum as an alternative to gold. And, and uh, you know, there, you, you, the credit cards, there's a platinum American Express card. There's no palladium uh, American <laughs> Express card. So, so you've, you've got a, a situation with, with platinum where it was considered an investment. So there's a lot of above ground stocks that are sitting in vaults. Uh, and that would probably, you know, but you would have to see platinum go through the roof. If, if fuel cells take off, and I, I personally believe you're going to see things go electric in, in 10 to 15 years, and then in 20 years, it, it's all going to be fuel cells. That's what I think. Yeah. And we've got well, a really nice platinum credit on our, in our, our. Uh, it's all good, in other words. Uh, almost any direction that cars go, yeah. we've got the metals for them. Terrific. Good presentation. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks for the questions, Murray. Um, Michael Potter, do you have questions for Carrie? Yes, Gary. Thanks very much for a fascinating presentation. You've, you've done a lot in a very short time. Um, what I'd like to know is what's your feeling on the possibility? Uh, how much do you think you might be able to re increase the metallurgical recovery on the palladium? Because I, I think the factory you've got at the moment is about 83% recovery. I mean, is that only 1% to get on that, go straight to the bottom line? Absolutely. You know, palladium back in, in the day used to have recoveries in the 60s and low 70s. And a lot of technologies come along to get it into the 80s. And, and I, you know, frankly, I don't think we can get it too much higher. But yes, 1% is huge because it almost comes free. Um, so we're working hard to do that. And we're testing all, all these different new technologies that have been developed in the last few years. Um, we don't want to introduce anything to this project that's brand new. We want something that's been, you know, in the field for at least five to, to eight years. But um, we, we, we are definitely looking at it. And if we can get that up a couple of percent, great. But there's no, there's no promise on that. I don't want to try to uh, overpromise uh, something. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Michael. Um, we're going to try David Kellerman one more time to see if his audio issues are still taking hold. I know he chatted in that he did indeed have a question. So, David, would you like to try to ask your yes. question again? Yes, I'm coming through. Great. Um, in the past, when Stillwater was running this project, as I recall, they had done a lot of work. Are you able to capitalize on a lot of that pre- work that they have or do you have, literally have to start from ground zero you know it's a very good question they did two things they did two big items one was the feasibility study and um, another one was their permitting so on the feasibility study we're we're taking some things for instance their tailings uh, the engineering that went into the tailings we're talking about millions of dollars worth of work um, is all good we're not changing very much in fact we've hired night peacehold to do that and they're the same company that did it for stillwater so um that's money in the bank we can we can use that other things other parts of it we didn't agree with the way they were mining they were mining these giant blocks with this giant equipment um getting heavy dilution putting their grade down so we're changing some of those things but 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 again we're able to use their studies as a, as a template and a, as a place to start which saves you a lot of money and it's also the reason we're going to be able to do our feasibility study in eight or nine months rather than like 18 months if we were starting from scratch but the most important thing that they did for us was start the permitting process because that permitting process was never stopped it was only uh delayed and it was it was put on hold and so we've indicated to the government we're restarting it so the two years of work that they put into that is again money in the bank for us because it typically takes a project four years to get permitted but we're halfway through that and the studies have been done we've got to take six months now to update all their studies because you know there's probably different species at risk uh, 
et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But we're going to update those studies. And boy, I'll tell you, I, I forget the number. There's about 3,200 pages of studies. Um, but they, they did all that and they spent all that money. And I believe that was, that was in excess of $10 million. And that again is money in the bank that we're not going to have to respend. We're going to have to spend a, a half a million to a million, um, redoing or updating the studies, but that's not like starting them all again from scratch. There'll just be addendums pasted onto the end of them. So well, yes. you're, the, you're the second guy in, usually you get the benefits. <laughs> as long as the first guy in, uh, well, we're actually the third guy in, but um, as long as the first two guys did good work, and in this case, they did. You mentioned um, you had a 52 cent offering in January, and then literally the stock got cut in half, and yeah. it's only made minor progress. Do you have any thoughts on the market dynamics? When 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 Palladium went from 2800 to 1500 in about a week, a week and a half in March. It just knocked the sales out of all of the, the, uh, the wind out of the sales in all of the palladium companies. So if you look at the other junior palladium companies, not the producers, because the producers have, have come back nicely, but the junior palladium companies, they're all kind of in the same boat. They've, they've not recovered back. And I think that um, the, one of the issues is, is that right now everybody's following gold. Everybody thinks gold's going up. Everybody's investing in gold and palladium is not gold. It is a precious metal. But I think what it has happened is there's been there's about seven or eight really good uh, Palladium Junior companies that have just been financed, are starting all their work programs, and there's going to be a lot of news coming out of our sector. And I think that there's there, there's going to be a, an audience built up for Palladium companies, and I think we're going to be on the top of most people's list. As you mentioned, the need for hydrogen fuel cells or some variation going forward. Do you think the car companies would come in as co-investors or some level of participation to fund this requirement for strategic metals going forward? Not just palladium or even potential for platinum, but even the cobalt guys and you know some, some of the other ones as well. I, I expect to see that happening. Um, I know that there was uh, Tesla was looking very hard at investing in some lithium companies. I don't know if they ever actually did, but uh, there's a really good precedent for this in the palladium business. In 2001, there was a big shortage of palladium, and so GM invested in Stillwater, the palladium mine in in, uh, in Montana, and Ford invested in in North American palladium, the the one that's not far from us in Ontario. So that's there are the precedents for that <laughs> happening. And if, if, if they get to the point where they're not sure they're going to be able to have enough metal to produce their cars, they're going to look really hard at that. Uh, and, and we are trying to get into some discussions with the traders who are the go-betweens to lock in a price during our construction period so we can ensure a very, very short payback period. So we're going to be talking to them. Whether we can do a deal, I, I, can't, I can't say, but uh, it would be great if we could. All right, great. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks for those questions, David. Um, I did see that Peter Trapp in the audience had his hand raised. Peter, would you like to ask your question? Uh, yeah, I got a couple of things. Uh, number one, uh, Kerry, I noticed that when you were doing your comparison of the different companies, exploration uh, and producers, uh, you didn't mention uh, the uh, Air Clean, I think, and Benson, which have just started up, at least Benson uh, did a deal with uh, Clean Air. Uh, and I think they're in the Thunder Bay area. Uh, and then the other one that I, I'm aware of is, of course, the Polymet project, which is in uh, northern Minnesota, which is admittedly it's an iron ore project, but also has quite a bit of PGMs in it. and I'm just wondering if there are any other companies that you can uh, in in the area in the exploration side that you would uh, that you would mention together with your uh, those, 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 those are the only two those are the only two in North America that I would think of uh, that are not in our group and the, and the clean air we just haven't just haven't updated that particular slide. Um, clean air is more of an exploration story than a than a development story at this point. Um, I, but they've got you know they've got some nice looking properties. Don't don't get me wrong. But it, it it's um, 
it's it's you know they're they're far away from ever doing a feasibility study. We're we're a little bit different that way. Um, a, a polymet, of course, is, is huge, but it's it's, it's again it's it's a, a, a palladium byproduct. And of course, polymet, I, I, I think, is going to not be permitted for a long, long time. Um, and then there's a third one in South Africa. It's a Canadian listed uh, company called Platinum um, Group Metals, even though it's more of a palladium company. And they, uh, they have a very large deposit. They own, I think, 50% of it in, uh, in South Africa that they're looking to develop. It's, a, it's an expensive project. It's, a, it's an eight-year payback or seven-year payback or something like that. But it's, uh, it's big, and, and you know, I think one day it'll get developed. But I think ours is a, ours is much sooner to product to full, full production, and ours is uh, much sooner certainly to uh, to pay back the capital. Yeah, I think um, that's interesting. You mentioned um, Platinum Group because I think that I think it's Implex that has uh, uh, was to do a joint venture with them, and they just backed out of it or told them that they weren't going to do it. But yeah. uh, the other thing I wanted to mention is because there's a lot of conversation about Sabanye. Uh, still water during this conversation uh, and their history with you. Uh, is the combination of those two companies now, it seems to me that Sabanier management is driving the bus. And um, they, as you know, own uh, over 50% of DRD uh, gold. I think that's the old Durban Deep in, in South Africa. And I'm getting the impression in, in talking to that management and watching the company, they seem to be going more down the gold line. Uh, so maybe you are seeing it from a different point of view. Maybe you've had conversations with the management there that leads you to believe that, you know, this platinum palladium thing is still kind of like the number one priority for them. I'm beginning to think that maybe their priority is changing a little bit. Maybe if you wouldn't mind commenting on that. Well, the, the, uh, Sabani is the largest gold producer in South Africa, yeah. which is something. And 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 Sabani is a precious metals company. Like they produce rhodium, they produce palladium, they produce platinum, they produce gold. And I think that um, one of the issues about trying to expand in the palladium business is there aren't any big palladium projects around. They're just they're, there's a lack of them. So for them to go big into the palladium. Uh, there's no mines left to buy. Virtually all the palladium mines in the world, I think, are owned by um, South African companies, and and nobody's selling them. So there's not. I think if they want to expand, and they've announced that they want to expand, and they announced that they want to spend up to five billion dollars expanding, they're going to probably have to go to gold. But I'm I'm you know I'm speaking a bit out of school. I can't speak for Sabani. That's just my own speculation. Okay. Um, yeah, I guess, as I understand it, the other platinum palladium projects are in Russia, and um, and and is it in Inner Mongolia? Is that the other project? Uh, There's a small one in Inner Mongolia, uh, Eurasia, but that their stock's been halted by the yeah. London Stock Exchange for about six months. I, I don't know why or by AIM. Um, but because of some, I don't know why, uh, you'd have to look into it. Uh, and then, of course, Norilsk has some uh, some deposits, uh, lower grade deposits in their mining now that they could develop and they're talking about developing. And if you try to read their website and make some sense out of it, it looks like they might develop it someday, but we're talking about something that's going to cost several billion dollars. So it's a pretty big commitment to the future palladium price if they're going to do that. And we're talking about sometime. 2035 to full production. Uh, you gave a timeline for your um, feasibility uh, yep. that goes out to 2022. Is there any chance that that gets accelerated, that it gets done sooner? Well, uh, the feasibility study is going to be done in the first quarter of 2021. It's the permitting that's taking longer. So is that going to be done faster? Well, we are pushing. We're pushing the government. Uh, the government of Ontario, the government of Alberta, different governments in Canada have been not relaxing environmental regulations, but trying to speed up the process because they know that post-COVID, there's going to be a, a high unemployment rate for a while until until we get things uh, going in terms of capital expenditures again. And we're we're the kind of a project that you know, we could have upwards of a thousand people working on site during construction 
and and 300 permanent jobs and every permanent job in the canadian north provides two other jobs so you know uh for for no government grant we don't need government money to build this mine uh so th they know that and 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 we are pushing on all different sides to try to get the government uh to speed this up and they may we're hoping they do but we again can't guarantee Thanks for your questions, Peter. Um, I know we had several chatted in from the audience, so I'd like to turn it over to Scott now and have him read those questions for us. Yeah, I want to thank everyone for sending in questions. Some of them have already been answered, but I'll read the few that have not yet been. Uh, first one is, how long before a decision to mine, to mine it is made? So we intend to make uh, 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 the feasibility study is, is, is um, due early 2021 and we intend to make that decision within about 60 days of the feasibility study being done and at that point it will be subject to final permitting and financing but um, what we intend to make that decision to pursue the financing uh, as soon as the feasibility study is done so early next year okay great not, and not that this, this might be part of that answer then too how much money would you need to build the mine so the, the the PEA that we did estimated 431 million Canadian dollars. So that's about 320 million US. Uh, we will be responsible for 80% of that. So about for us about uh, call it 250 million dollars in US dollars. Of that, we think that uh, we could probably do a third, a third, a third. So a third uh, equity, a third um, bank financing and up to a third something called streaming streaming is something that a lot of mining companies uh, do to finance their mines for example we could do a stream on the uh on the gold byproduct that we have we have 470,000 ounces of gold um we're going to be producing uh you know something around 20,000 ounces of gold a year um we can stream that out to one of the many streaming companies um uh and and po possibly get it another third so another 70 80 million dollars for that stream uh just to give you an example there's a company called um callus i think callus gold that just sold announced a stream yesterday to wheat and precious metals for 110 million dollars for about the amount of gold that we're going to be producing so we would still get all the platinum and the copper and the palladium but but sell the gold um at, at, a, at a big discount uh, in order to finance the mine. So there's different ways we can go. Excellent, thank you. Okay, I think this is the last question, um, unless anybody has one that they wanna send in right now. This is, I believe this is a palladium copper project, but could you provide or show the company valuation by individual metals, example, palladium, copper, gold, silver, and other? Well, I think, um, I don't know the exact what they're asking. Uh, here's the breakdown of the metal that we have. Um, I think that's what they're asking. Yeah. Is that is that showing on your guys' screens? It is. Yep. Yeah. So there it is. So we got a little over a billion pounds of copper. Our biggest uh, asset is, of course, the palladium, 3.8 million ounces. Uh, platinum is is no slouch at a, at a million point uh, two, and uh, almost a half a million ounces of gold. And those are just the measured and indicated categories. There's each of those four metals is contained in the inferred in the bottom right hand corner. Uh, so so that'll bring the gold up to about 500,000 ounces and the palladium up to about uh, a little over 4 million ounces, etc. Excellent. Well, that is all of the questions from the audience. We want to thank everybody who sent in a question. And now I think we'd like to turn it back over to you, Carrie, for some final comments. Well, I just want to say it's going to be a busy year for us. There's going to be lots of news. I think if you're interested in the palladium space as an alternative to gold or, or to, uh, to platinum uh, and you like developing companies, I think we're the, we're the pick because uh, we're shortest time to production. We've got uh, a tier one number of ounces of palladium equivalent in the ground. Nobody, uh, I mean, other platinum group metals has more, but there aren't too many others with... I can't think of any that you could buy in the stock market. So I think we're a go-to company and I think just follow us, uh, sign up, go up, go to our website and sign up and just you, you'll see the news flow coming out big time. 
And then, of course, there's always the wild card if we tuck into one of those uh, high-grade deposits uh, during our drilling this year, uh, you know, that, that'll be a game changer for us. Thank you all for Great. coming in. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you, Carrie, and thank you, Generation Mining, and thank you for everyone who came today. We want to uh, wish you a very good evening. Thank you. Bye now. Bye.